for the acceleration. Uh -oh. Let's do that part first. Right. There's acceleration of function at time. So this is... Time. So we write down our stuff. A of t is equal to, they give us this equation, 30 plus, 30 plus 2t is equal to dv dt. And you can look up and up above in your notes, look back at your notes how you do these problems, right? I always just kind of, you could jump right to the integration part. I always just like to do this, just remind myself what's happening. So then I put the dt on the same side as the t's here. t dt is equal to dv. I'm going to integrate both sides. Integrate, integrate. And so I can do this integral in my head. 30t plus 2t squared over 2 is equal to... Oh, well, this is going, I should put the bounds on that. That's going from 0 to t, and that's going from 0 to v. If you carry out the integral, it's that. I meant to bring my T89 today to kind of show you how to do some of these problems with T89. Forgot it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to make a little video of, like, how to use the T89. I don't know how to use the TI-84. I don't know how to use the TI-83. I don't know how to use a, what's the new one, Inspire. It's one of them in there, right? The Inspire. And then there's a CA. That's the same. Oh, that's the same thing. Yeah, I don't know how to use that. I will show you how to use the 89, because it's the best. Okay? But just to show you, just to show you, like, just to demonstrate how it's used. Yeah. On these integrals, this is the same principle you explained, like, on the first and second day, where you differentiate it with respect to two different variables, and we're okay with the different principles. The, the, the thing I'm okay with, this is the thing. If you try to plug in, like, the integral 30 plus 2t dt from 0 to t, your calculator would say, right, you can't do that. If I said integrate 30 plus 2t from 0 to x, it would do it. Right. So you can't use the t and the dt down below. You can't do that. So I'm actually breaking that rule. But it's it's a kind of a shorthand way of doing it. Well, it's like more on the left. Hand so, the, right. so that's the left hand side. You do it with respect to time. And the right hand side, you do it with v. And that's totally legal. You can oh, do that. Okay. Yep, you absolutely could do that, right? And so you carry out the, the left hand side, which is just one times dv basically, and you carry it, that's just constant, and you carry it out. So v v minus zero is what it would be. Right? Right. And and that, that's how you do that one. So that's legal. The thing I can't do is the dummy thing. Right. I'm skipping the I'm skipping the dummy variable. I, I actually I believe even in math they call it the they call it a dummy variable. Reaching back. What's that? Thank, Thank you. you. Oh yeah, you betcha. You betcha, man. That's what I'm here for. Okay, so then that, that's my velocity as a function of time. That's the equation, right? I mean, it's, it said it's equal to v, but really, I mean, that, that's it. That's v of t, right? If I want velocity, there, I mean, I, that's it. I mean, I put in the time, and it tells me what my velocity is, my final velocity, right? And so the, the problem statement, so that's just my velocity of time. I'm going to need that a little bit later. Actually, I need it right now, too. It says, what is, I, I need to find how much time it takes me to get to 400 meters a second. Right? I could have put in, right, the problem statement said it goes, right, the problem statement says it's going under 400 meters per second. I could have put a 400 right here, right? And if you did that, that would told, that your answer would have been how much time it took you to get to 400. But then the next step is I have to integrate the velocity equation. I wouldn't have the velocity equation. So I, I, I'm going to leave it as a function for now, and then I, then I plug it in later. I'll put in the 400. So right now I'm, I, I need the time at 400, so I'm going to do that. 300t plus 2t squared over 2. Oh, I'm going to simplify that. Watch this. I can do that in my head, too. That's just t squared is equal to 400. And I can solve for that. That, I just plug it into my calculator. I, I mean, in the TI-89, it's, 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 a, it's a thing called solve, you know, F2, solve. And then I write, type in 300t plus t squared is equal to 400 in terms of x, or in terms of t, comma, t, and then out pops the answer. There's two answers, right, because there's a thing. It's a quadratic, and so the, the one that makes sense is t equal to 10 seconds. So that's how much, long, how much time it took to get to 
400 meters a second. And then there's our velocity equation. Okay. Uh, then what we're after is the total distance traveled. So I need to see how much distance we've covered in this much time as well. So now I, I, I got to go to my position. Say my velocity is equal to, well, that velocity equation is 300 T plus T squared. Zero, That's, 30T? did I add a zero? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, let me finish. I wasn't done yet. <laughs> Divided by 10. <laughs> That's another joke I like to use when I, when I make mistakes. Absolutely call me out. But, but my favorite joke is just to be like, I wasn't done yet. I wasn't done yet. I was just saying, what was wrong? With, I was just going to get to say what was wrong with this, right? Yeah. Thank you. You're going to get tired of me using that joke, but I did not get tired of it, so... <laughs> so I will keep doing it. 30t plus t squared is equal to, that's ds dt, right? And I put the t's on the same side. And so this would be 300t plus t squared, 30, sorry, 30t plus t squared dt is equal to ds. Integrate both sides. This is going from... Here we can put in the bounds. So that's going from 0 to 10 seconds, right? Because this is that's how long it took. It was 10 seconds right there. 0 to 10 seconds. And this is going from 0 to S. And we'll call SF. That's where we're headed. That's, how, that's the distance we're after right there is what that SF is. Okay. Oh, what did I do? Oh, I stole part of that. Did it again. Put that back. Right. Alright. Well, what I would do at this point, TI 89, beep, 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 and then it calculating, then out pops the answer, right? That's how I would do it when I got to that stage. And now, if you get, if you're on an exam, you get to this point right here. Plug that sucker in. You don't have to go through all those steps. You don't have to integrate this. I mean, it's a simple integral, but you don't have to integrate. You don't have to take, take that and integrate it and then, and, then, and then do the bounds. I don't care. Just put it right in the calculator, right? 100% okay with that. And in fact, I prefer that because, one, it just be, it keeps your exams like really clean and concise and just really tight. And then, two, you probably get the right answer. If you do it the other way, you probably get the wrong answer. I'm serious. Use that freaking calculator. It's a tool. From here on out, here on out. In your careers, use those tools. I don't think you're gonna, except for math. That's the only problem. I, you guys done with the math series? Net? Not yet. Those sons of bitches over there, they could be teaching you how to do all this stuff with your calculators. And instead, they pull them away from you and say, okay, now do the problem with hand, your hand behind your back. Stupid, stupid. Don't tell them I said that, but do tell them. Do tell them I said that. But don't, but don't. Tell them Kirsten said that. Tell them Kirsten, <laughs> like, like Kirsten, what? She, I think we disagree a little bit on this, but I, uh, I, a little bit. I just said just use that calculator. And what did you get? I plugged that sucker in my calculator. And I get 1833. 1833 meters. Okay, so that's... So it's gone 1833 meters in the acceleration, right? And so I need that a little bit later because I need to figure out the total distance, okay? So now we're on to the D cell. Uh-oh. Look at that. D <laughs> Close enough. Deceleration. All right. So this is acceleration of function of velocity. And in this, this case right here, we got A of V is equal to negative 0 0.003 V squared, right? So that acceleration changes with respect to velocity, right? And we're dealing with, we're, gonna, we're dealing right with right now is we're trying to go from acceleration to position, right? Saying that we want the acceleration to position and then there's velocity in there as well. So we're going to use that shortcut. There was a shortcut up above where we used the chain rule. It said right here, 
He said, yep, yeah, right. If you want velocity as a function of position, use this shortcut. So we're gonna use, we're gonna use that shortcut, okay? You do, do you have to use a shortcut? No. So the, actually the next page of notes, we go down here. I think that I included this in your, your notes that I handed out. The next page of notes after this example problem is me not using it. Do you guys have this page of notes, the second page? That's not using this. So if you wanted to do it not using the shortcut, you would do this. And it's a little bit longer, right? You have to go through and figure out how much you, you, you go through and figure out your velocity equation. Then you have to integrate your velocity equation with the time. And then it figures out the distance. And once you get that distance, then you go from there. It's a little bit longer. So we're gonna that's the long way of doing it, if you want to make note. And then the, we're going to use the shortcut. I'm going to make that shortcut. Long way next page. Okay, there's the, the short way. The shortcut. So then this, what we do for the shortcut, use the chain rule, say A of V is equal to DV DT. Use the chain rule, so this becomes DV DS DS DT. That right there is just the velocity. You don't have to do this every time, right? If you, if you go up to your notes, you can just grab what that equation is. I just like to do it just to remind myself where, where we're coming from here. So this is dv ds times v. And so you put all the v stuff together and then separate that ds. So the ds is going to go on the left. ds is equal to v over a of v dv. Put all the V's together, all the DS's together. Okay, now let's put in, we, we know what that AV equation is, right? DS. DS is equal to V over negative 0 0.003 V squared DV. Okay, and we integrate both sides. Integrate, integrate. So this one is going from, we'll, go, we'll call it, we'll leave it variables here. That's going from S1, S final. This is going from V1 to V final. So that V on the top, this V right here, that V is the same as that V, right? So that thing gets, that just simplifies down, right? So let's define some of these, these bounds right here. S1 is going to be that 1833. Right? That's what we're starting out. That's initial position is 1833. SF is what we're after. Right? V naught, or V1 rather, V1 is equal to, that's the velocity it was going right at the beginning, which is oh, 400. Right? That was given to us in the problem statement. And then V final, that's what they gave us two in the problem statement is 100. So we're trying to figure out how much distance is covered between 400, you know, going from zero to 400 down, back down to 100. And what's the total distance? And so the VF is the 100. So what this becomes is, I guess just plug in all the variables. Uh, integral SF. Oh, sorry. I'm putting actual values. This is 1833. SF, that's what we're after. And then DS is equal to the integral from 400 to 100. Well, I'll just leave it like this, but you could simply, well, let's do 1 over negative 0 0.003 V dV. I simplified it down a little bit. Right, so that, those Vs, that, that V squared, V over V squared, so that guy goes away and that guy goes down to 1, right? But really, I mean, so what I would do right there, DI 89. Go. And then it would give me the answer. Okay. And the answer is 2295.1. The 
That would be a good thing. I'm going to talk to the TAs. I think you, maybe they could add in how to use a calculator into the thing. In my undergrad, we absolutely, we, we, the calculator was required for, for my, I had a math degree, it was a TI-92. Have you ever seen a TI-92? It's got a QWERTY keyboard. It's like this big. It's got a QWERTY, like a little teeny QWERTY keyboard, you know? It was super nerdy, but we used it for everything everything but then i now have a crutch where i can't do anything without the calculator but what's nice about it is i don't have to remember like as i get through i get to the step right here i don't have to remember like how do you do how do you integrate one over a variable like there's a natural log involved is that correct i think right i mean who cares i don't have to remember that anymore i don't have to think about that i don't have to go look that up i just i just brainlessly type that thing in and just let it let my calculator do that that's, that's what that tool is for and then as you move even further forward in your careers you, you don't even use your calculator you use a computer and you have a computer do this shit for you right it's like oh uh-huh. Mat- MATLAB? Me and MATLAB are best buds, right? If you've, if you've taken a MATLAB class, you'll learn to like it. I mean, you love it. I mean, like, love it even. I love that. You will. It's awesome. I freaking love MATLAB. And, and, and we're going to use some MATLAB at the end. You don't have to. You don't have to. You can do it the old-fashioned way, but I'm going to do some of these problems, especially when the 3D stuff, I'm going to do it in MATLAB. It, and, and I'm going to show you how to do it in MATLAB if you want to do it that way. But you just let the computers are made. Are there tools that are made to do this stuff? Use them. Okay. All right, so that's that problem. Any questions about that one? Not too bad. All right, so this is the long way. If you want to do it the long way, you can kind of look to see how to do it the long way. You get, the, you get to the same answer, 2295. All right, now we're getting into curved motion. So this is, this is motion in multiple directions. But it just ends up being uh, multiple 1D problems. I don't know if I put that in there. Yeah. It just, it just ends up being multiple 1D problems. Which, which, which isn't bad. You, you, you basically have to do this. Eventually, you could end up having to do this stuff in three different directions. The X, Y, and the Z direction, you could, you could solve this. Or in, in, in some of these other coordinate systems, you could do it in the, the R direction and the theta direction, possibly. But, but you solve them the same way. So now we have those tools set on how to solve acceleration function of velocity, acceleration function of position, constant acceleration, and acceleration function of time. We have that in our toolbox. Let's move forward and let's like look at multiple degree of freedom uh, or, or multiple directions as well. Curved motion. Right, so in curved motion, we're going to have three different types of systems. And, and, and you'll see a little bit later why we have these different coordinate systems. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense to try to do some problems in Cartesian coordinates. That's our favorite, right? It's just X, Y, and Z direction. That one's our favorite. But there's certain types of problems, right? Like orbital problems would be an example where Carte- trying to do that with Cartesian would be really hard. But using it with polar coordinates, or polar or cylindrical or normal tangent, doing it that way, it makes our lives a lot easier. So we're going to introduce these three different coordinate systems, right? And then again, with our procedures, we'll look to see, oh, are you doing Cartesian? And once you end up in Cartesian, then you figure out uh, uh, what type of problem is. Acceleration function, velocity, position, whatever it is. And then you solve multiple directions. Okay. So that's enough about that. So Cartesian. We're going to start out with Cartesian coordinate system. We're going to define some properties in there. We're actually, we're going to su- define position, velocity, and acceleration in this coordinate system. Okay. So here's the path. Our particle is traveling along that path. And then somewhere in there, we have to have a coordinate system, right? A frame of reference in a coordinate system. Our coordinate system is going to be over here, and it's just the X, Y, Z coordinate system. Right? That's our favorite and there's an origin associated with that. And then we're going to add in this position vector. R is the position vector, right? And it points to the particle, right? And then we, we, we introduced this a little bit earlier too. And then after a certain amount of time, that particle is going to move over to a different location. But if I was to define this position in this coordinate system, you do it like this. You say R is equal to X in the I direction plus y in the j direction plus z in the k direction the x is the magnitude y is the ma- is the magnitude and z is the magnitude and then they're in the directions i direction j direction and k direction that's how we're going to handle vectors in here we're going to have i j's and k directions okay you could also write this i actually prefer it this way you write it as a vector x y z Right? So write my vector like that, 
and just know that X is in the I, Y is in the J, and Z is in the K direction. That's a little bit cleaner. Your calculator can handle vectors like this when you put them in there. Sometimes you could even put this thing, you can make it a column vector too. You make that's an X, Y, Z. Right? You can you can write it like that as well. Okay. But there's some reasons why we don't do that. You know, part of, part of the reason we don't do that is you're going to see just in a second when we do this derivation, we need the I's, the J's, and the K's. All right, I'll try to do, I'll try to demonstrate when we have problems where using this notation is nice because your calculator can handle that. Your TI-89, your TI-89 can handle that, right? But if you could do it, 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 it there's, there's some reasons you'd want to use that notation. But in our notes and stuff, we're doing it this way, right? And like I said, you'll see in a few minutes why why it makes sense to have those directions associated with it. So in this case, the I hat, the J hat, and the K hat, these are base vectors. Right? They're unit vectors as well. Unit vectors mean they just have a magnitude of one They're unit vectors, and they have direction. Unit vectors, and then they have direction. Kind of our first time we've seen those. I'm trying to be clear, clean with the hats on them. The hats just mean they're unit vectors. All right, so now we've defined, that's our position. That's how we're defining position. Right. How far is that particle in the x direction, or sorry, how far is that particle in the i direction, the y, uh, the j direction, and the k direction? And that tells us exactly where that particle is. So if we define velocity, it, we take the derivative of the position. So that's what we do right now. Come down to velocity, say, yep, velocity is equal to, these are all in vectors here. We're back in vectors, we're out of rectilinear stuff, so this is, take the derivative of the position, or, no, that's wrong. That is a velocity is dr dt. Can't even read my own writing. Dr dt, and we substitute in what r is. R is so we take the derivative of r in the i direction. Oh no 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 x in the i direction. X in the i direction plus y in the j direction, plus z in the k direction. All of that, dt. Okay, we're taking the derivative of that position. Now, one thing to note here, right, this is actually, we treat these things as separate, x and the i, those are two different, that's x times i. What happens if we take the derivative of something times something? What do you have to use? But it's the product rule. I think it's the product rule. What does the product rule say? Derivative of the first thing. Yeah, leave the second thing alone. Take the derivative of the second thing and leave the first thing alone. So you have to do that here for each one of these terms. So this thing kind of blows up on us a little bit. So this becomes, this is dx dt in the i direction plus x times di dt plus dy dt in the j direction plus y times dj dt plus dz dt in the k direction plus z times dk dt. Okay, we're going to apply the chain rule to that thing, or no, sorry, the product rule to that thing and, and carry it out. So let's look at this here. Let's look at these terms. That's di. So, so in this case, for this particular coordinate system, our coordinate system sitting over here, right? The x, y, the z. How is the x, y, and z, our coordinate system changing with respect to time? It's not. It's stationary. It's sitting off to the side. It's not moving. So 
how, what, I mean, what happens to this thing? Di, what does Di do, right? It's, it's not changing with respect to time, so it goes to zero. You might be like, oh, obviously, all these other terms are gonna go to zero. Later on, if the next thing we do when we do polar coordinates, that's not the case. Our coordinate system is actually moving with the particle. Our coordinate system is going to be attached to the particle. So when it's like this term later on does not go to zero. When we take the derivative of the base vector, it doesn't go to zero. In this particular case, those suckers go to zero. So all these guys go to zero. This guy goes to zero. That guy goes to zero, and this guy goes to zero. So you're just left with those i, j, and k directions. And so that is what we give you down here. I wrote it in two different ways. Right. So the velocity in Cartesian coordinate system is just how is x change with respect to time in the i, how is y change with respect to, uh, with respect to time in the j, and how z change with respect to t in the k. Right? And then the other way to write that is just Vx in the i, Vy in the j, and Vz in the k. So Vx is just Vx dt, Vy is just Vy dt, and Vz is just dz dt. Okay? So you do the same thing. So that's velocity, right? So there's kind of just decoupled motion, basically, that it comes up with. Uh, the next step would be to do acceleration. You do the same thing with acceleration. Acceleration is just the derivative of the velocity. This is equal to the derivative of Vx in the i plus Vy, Vy in the j plus Vz in the k direction. All that with respect to time. Right. Same thing happens. You get dVx dt in the i plus di, vx, sorry, vx, times di, dt, and then so on. Put some dots there. And so again, that guy goes to zero. But the same thing happens. We won't carry, we won't carry out all those things, but, but what's the next? This is an x. I didn't quite cross it enough, but you just carry it out and it just keeps going and you do all those other terms again. All the derivatives with respect to the base vector all go to zero, or derivatives of the base vector go to zero, and so you're just left with these other terms, and so this is what you get. That's what our acceleration terms are. It's just, it's just the again very decoupled. What's happening in the x is not what's happening in the y, or it does not affect what's happening in the y, which is not what ha it does not affect what's happening in the z direction. So you have the ax, the ay, and the j. So it's just three one D problems that we have to solve. Okay, that's kind of the derivation. That again, we kind of go through that exercise. I could have just jumped right to it, but just to show when when you do this derivative right here, you do have to use the product rule, and you do end up looking at the derivative of the base vector again later on our base vector is going to be changing with time, and so that term doesn't go to zero. We pick up some extra stuff when we do that. Okay? So some examples using this, right? Projectile motion. This is high school physics stuff. Right? Decouple motion. Class example, projectile motion. To do these problems, so we'll just kind of introduce it. Use these in your homework for next week. Some of the assumptions you make with this. Constant. Right. We assume constant gravity with this. I saw a video the other day that kind of demonstrated gravity with this like spandex thing and a ball rolling across the spandex. Did you see that? I'm gonna watch it. We're gonna watch it. It's beautiful. I'd never seen that before. I just learned that. I was like, holy crap. That's really neat to think about how that works. So, but anyway, so then you can kind of see how it wouldn't, how it, it is a factor of how far away you are. The further you get away, then it's less attractive. The closer you get, the closer you are, because you're closer to that big dip. It's pretty cool. We'll try to find it. We'll try to watch that on Friday too. Um, we're gonna ne neglect, drag, and lift. 
right? Obviously those things are going to be there, right? The, the wind or the air is gonna affect the travel of our, our projectile as you go through the air, right? If there's wind applied or, or if your object is, is made a certain way, it could actually start it'd be lifted by the, uh, by the air as it goes along, right? air foils and such, okay? And then the other assumption is that the earth is flat. I don't like to say that. It isn't, just wanna make that clear. But we pretend, okay? It's not flat. It's not. It's not flat. But we're pretend it's flat. All right? Um, and then in these problems, the acceleration in the x direction uh, ax is zero, right? It's not accelerating in the x direction, it doesn't have any propellant. And then a y is negative g. Right. I kind of set up these projectile motion problems. So we have g acting down. G doing that. Okay. Um, and then, so again, you just kind of treat these things as multiple 1D problems. So I just kind of break it into the x and y direction. We'll define velocity acceleration in those, or velocity and position in those, those two different directions. So in the x direction, uh, it's a constant acceleration. It just happens to be zero. So we'll say vx of t is equal to v naught x plus ax times t. All right, so this, if you looked up, right, this is, this is just... A, multiple 1D problems. If you looked up above and said, what's my constant acceleration? How do I get velocity from constant acceleration problems? It's just V naught plus AX times T. In this particular case, AX is zero. V naught X, right, is the component of the velocity in the X direction. And so we do this a lot in here. You review your trigonometry. My son is just starting, my 14 year old is in high school, he just started geometry. And just yesterday he goes, Who, whoever uses this? Like, why do I need to know triangles? And why do I need to know? And I was like, oh, I use this shit every day. And so will you guys, as you move forward in life, youth, right? Youth these days, right? Who, what kind of nerd uses triangles all day? Well, come and tell my class that. They do it every day. It might be a bunch of nerds, but they're going to be smart. They're smart nerds. They're going to make some good money, and they're going to have real jobs. You leave us alone. You, you leave us nerds alone. So it's just going to be V naught cosine theta. Right? It's this, it's this leg right here. That leg is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse. Right? So it's going to be v naught cosine theta. And so that's what a v naught x is. And so you take that, right, that's, that's this, right? So, and so this is what our velocity is a function of x, uh, velocity of function of time is, it's just this. For the x direction, for a projectile motion. Right? For position, look it up for a 1D problem. X is a function of time. It's going to be X naught plus V naught X times time plus 1 half AX T squared. Again, we're going to, in this problem statement, it's starting out at zero. So X naught is zero. AX is zero. So you just got V naught X times T. And so the position is just that guy right there. We're gonna do an example here in a little bit too to kind of demonstrate this. Maybe yeah, actually more complicated than just this. This is just kind of re-derive equations that you've used before. Okay, so that's that's the x direction, right? Just multiple one. That's just one uh, one d problem. Then we just go over to decoupled motion and say what's happening in the y direction. In the y direction, a x or sorry, a y. Ay is equal to negative g. 
And so it's a V Y of T is equal to V not Y plus A Y times T. Let's go to one D constant acceleration problems. We get that, that equation there. V not Y is gonna be the other component of that triangle, which is just gonna be V naught sine of theta. And then a y is negative g, so what you end up with is just this guy right here. That's my velocity in the y direction. And then we do the position in the y direction. Equal to y naught plus v naught y times t plus one half a y t squared. Why not is zero. But that's the only thing that's zero. The other things have value variables values. And so that is what our position is for projectile motion, starting at zero. No drag, flat earth. Actually, the, so far we've made no assumption on the earth being flat. I mean, it quickly comes in. Eh, yeah, we have. Right, because really the curve, the, the curve would be doing like this, right? So that Y position would be changing, but anyways. Question? Concerns? Arguments? Okay, let's do an example. Kind of like that. It's a little more complicated than just a straight projectile motion because we we're going to start at different heights and stuff. But that just kind of show you that, like, look, they're just they're independent directions. And you'll actually use those in one of your homework problems as well. All right. Here's an example. It's a strange example. I got this out of a book. Okay. I don't know when this would happen. So we've got a particle at B, and we have a particle at A. So there's a particle here and here. B is starting out at 100 feet above ground and it's being shot at a a has we give it it has an acceleration of two feet per second so a, a travel to the right at 10 feet per second so it has an initial velocity 10 feet per second and it has acceleration of two feet per second squared so this guy's going that direction and then we're trying to find what v naught is required to strike uh for to have b strike a how does what initial velocity do i need to shoot this guy so that it hits this guy over here someplace okay very strange you, have this, you can think of it as those weapons people. We, we a is some car trying to get away, and B, and it's got an acceleration and initial velocity, and then B is a really bad gun where you can't change the direction, but you can change the velocity of the thing that you're shooting. So it's like a fixed gun, and you can just you have to do some quick calculations on what your velocity needs to be in order to hit that thing down below. I have no idea how this, when this would ever come up, but. It's come up right now, and so we'll solve this problem. Okay. Sometimes it's nice just to think. So we're trying to figure that initial velocity. Just to say, before we dive in, before we dive in, what, like, what's going to be, like, how are we going to do this? What, what are we going to do? We've got seven minutes. What are we going to do? Yeah. Figure out the location where we would intersect first. That's exactly right, right? <laughs> For them to hit each other, they have to have the same position. And so what, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at particle B in the X and Y direction and say, what is its X position and its Y position as a function of time? And then I'm going to go down to particle A and I'm going to say, what is its position in the X and Y direction as a function of time? And then I'm going to set those suckers equal to each other, right? And then what we're going to, what we're going to end up with is two equations and two unknowns. One of the unknowns is going to be time, and the other unknown is going to be what we're after, is that velocity. So it's going to be two equations, two unknowns, and, we're, and out will pop this answer, okay? Especially with the TI-89. Okay. All right, so let's do, let's go down and we'll do this. This is great. And so I, once you kind of lay that out, always take a time, before you start diving in, just really just, how am I going to do this? Even if, and then if you don't figure out, well, then just dive in. And sometimes it kind of comes in, it, 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 it'll come to you. But sometimes it's nice just to kind of come up with a plan. So your particle A, X direction. Let's do that one first. Particle A, X direction. We'll crank this sucker out real quick. A, A, X. Okay. 
AAX is equal to 2 feet per second squared. VAX is equal to 10 feet per second. They give us that. Right? They tell us what that, that initial velocity is. And so constant velocity or constant acceleration, so we can look at this up, SAX is equal to SAX naught plus VAX times T plus AAX T squared over 2. Right? That just came from a constant velocity 1D problem. Right? And substitute our stuff in, SAX is equal to 10t, that's that initial velocity, plus AA, is, AAX is 2t, right over 2, sorry, AAX is 2, just put it like that, we'll leave it like that. So that is the position of particle A as a function of time, right? So now we look at the y direction, A, uh, 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 A, Y direction. Let's do that next. And, ooh, I got that one. What's the position of Y as a function of, or what is the position of particle A in the Y direction? Zero. Zero. That sucker is just traveling that way. It has no Y component to it. It's just staying on the ground like that. Okay, that's my second one. All right, now we're on to B, BX direction. All right, BX direction, SBX. We've got three minutes, we're gonna do it. BX is equal to SBX naught plus VBX naught times time plus AX T squared over two. No acceleration in the X direction for this guy. Uh, no initial position in that one either. So it's just that. And this just becomes SBX as a function of time is four fifths V naught times time. Because right. they gave us this four, three, four, five triangle. I only got two minutes. All right, let's do the last one real quick. I'll come back to that. We'll, we'll cover this again la next time. I'll just kind of come back and point out these triangle things. You should really like it when you get a triangle like that. It saves you from having to use thetas and stuff like that, but we'll come back to that. And now we're in the Y direction. B, B, Y direction. And so we do S, B, Y. Y as a function of time is equal to S B Y naught plus V B Y naught times time plus one half A B Y T squared. All right, so plug in variables that we know. S B Y naught is 100. They give us that at the beginning. Minus three fifths. V naught T, because it's being shot down, so it's a negative there, minus one half times, use the right G here, in this case it's 32.2, because we're in feet, times T squared. S, B, Y is a function of time. Right, that's our last, last thing. So what we do at this point right here, like I said, we'll revisit and we're running out of time. So we'll revisit this next time. But in order for these things to hit each other, 
the position of B and the X, the position of A and the X have to be the same, and the position of A and the Y has to be the same as the position of B and the Y. So what you do at this point, this is how I would do it. I would set it up like this. I see there's two equations and two unknowns. And the two equations are SAX has to be equal to SBX. Those two, those two guys are equal to each other. And... These two have to be equal to each other, right? And, the, and you can see the unknowns here, right? There's time is an unknown, and V0 is an unknown, right? And so how I did it is I plugged the, your TI-89, we'll do two equations and two unknowns, solve, plug in the first equation, solve, or, or comma, plug in the second equation, solve it with respect to V naught and T, and then it goes, and it goes calculating, and then it actually pauses for a second because it's a little bit more, a little more complicated. And so it pauses for a second, and then it out does pop the answer, okay? And it's beautiful. And you just set it up like that, let your calculator do the math. How else would you do it? You do substitution if you want. You could solve, you could set the two equal to each other, solve for one of the variables, take that variable, plug it down below. Absolutely, you could do it that way. Right? I just like letting the calculator do it. So uh, the answer, oh, I will, I'll give you the answer next time. We'll, we'll revisit too, just because was. I want to show you the triangle trick, just for those of you that uh, don't know how to do that. I often, the reason I say that is I get a lot of people that solve for what the theta needed to be, and then they use sines and cosines after they solve for that theta, and it's, it's way more difficult. If you just use the three, four, five, and just do the four-fifths, three-fifths thing, your life's going to be a lot easier. Okay, break. You always, it always makes me think that you're like really enthralled with what I'm talking about, but you're just staying here because Kirsten's class is right afterwards. So.